Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, and today I'm just going to finish off um, our discussion about uh, epidemiology and about disease process and that sort of thing. It will just be a brief bit. And then we're going to move on to talking about viruses. And we'll, in our subsequent classes, we'll talk about actual viral diseases. Um, okay, so this is where we finished off last time. This was my last slide, and I was talking to there are different ways in which disease can be transmitted. And the first set of processes is by inanimate reservoirs, inanimate stores of um, disease causing organisms, which we then pick up. So um, again, vehicle transmission refers specifically to inanimate reservoirs. Um, it, you could even regard air, the air as being a reservoir if we think of things like influenza, COVID, these sorts of things where even though it's just temporary, there is a, a stock of disease causing organism in the air, which we would inhale. Much, much uh, more important in actual fact, all over the world are waterborne uh, is the waterborne diseases, which are still a major, major cause of infant mortalities and adult mortalities as well, but especially infant mortalities. Water is a major vehicle of transmission of disease, uh, especially where um, infrastructure does not provide purified water and where the possibility of contamination, for example, by sewage, etc., is likely. The last one we'll discuss here is foodborne. There are a number of different diseases which can be transmitted by food. The best known, of course, is salmonella, but there are various other ones which we'll hear when we, especially when we talk about bacterial diseases, we will devote some time to talking about the foodborne diseases, which also are a major problem worldwide here in the United States as well. Salmonella would be one. E. coli is another one. Uh, Listeria is, is another. OK, so that's inanimate um, reservoirs, vehicles of transmission. A vector is specifically a living thing, a living organism which moves a disease organism to a host. And um, the most important vectors of all are the arthropods, mostly insects, fleas, mosquitoes, mosquitoes especially, but also arachnids like ticks, um, which here in the United States you have probably heard of, are uh, vectors of things like Lyme disease. So when you think about vectors, there are two ways in which they can transmit. The first is by simple mechanical transmission. So that the classic example, of course, is the fly, which moves from manure or feces somewhere um, straight to food and transports particles of that to the food which then contaminates whoever eats it. In actual fact, in the United States, this is, and in Western countries, this is not a major, major problem, disgusting though it may sound. Um, there are actually, there's not a, a lot of disease transmitted directly by this means, but in third world countries and in tropical areas, it is really a very big problem. And there is, a, in addition to um, foodborne diseases and things like that, uh, to gut diseases that could be uh, transported by mechanical transmission. Um, in tropical areas, there are some parasitic diseases which are also mechanically transmitted, um, especially eye diseases, uh, which occur in tropical regions. By far the most important vector transmission, however, is biological transmission. And biological transmission has the distinction that the pathogen actually reproduces inside the vector. 
So for example, in the case of malaria, a major part of the malaria life cycle is completed inside the mosquito. The mosquito has to be infected with the malaria pathogen, the malaria parasite. And the malaria parasite reproduces inside the mosquito and migrates to the salivary glands of the mosquito. When the mosquito bites um, a warm-blooded host, it injects saliva, which is, has an anticoagulant in it. And the saliva contains the next stage of the parasite, which then goes through another part of its life cycle in the human host or whichever host it happens to have been bitten. Um, this is true for, for several different kinds of parasitic diseases. We'll see some of them, others in a minute. Um, but it is also true for some viral diseases. So, for example, yellow fever is a disease which is a viral disease which is transmitted by mosquitoes. But in order for it to be transmitted, the mosquito actually needs to be infected with the virus. The virus goes through reproductive stages in the mosquito. It's not just the mosquito picks up some blood from somebody with the, with the disease and then goes and injects it into another host the pathogen actually goes through an infectious stage inside the vector, which then transmits it. This is, by the way, one very important thing to remember. You will often um, hear people, for example, talking about um, a disease like HIV, a human immunodeficiency virus, and asking the question, oh, isn't it possible for a mosquito to bite somebody with AIDS and then go and bite somebody and inf and infect them. Well, there's your answer right there. No, they can't do that because the mosquito is not going to be infected with HIV. HIV is strictly a human disease. It's not going to infect a mosquito and allow it to infect somebody else. A disease like yellow fever actually infect the mosquito. The mosquito reproduces the virus before it transmits it um, to another host. So the class, here's a classical example of mechanical transmission, the common fly landing somewhere noxious and then flying to our food and, and contaminating it. But as I say, this, the risk of this is very much overblown in, in Western societies. Um, and your risk of actually acquiring illness by this means is actually for us quite remote. But there are specific diseases, uh, especially in tropical areas, which are transmitted, that can be transmitted in this fashion. Um, okay, but here, here are the really important uh, vector-borne diseases that we need to think about. We won't do them all, but please look through the, the whole list and read through it, but I'll just do a couple of them of the really important ones for you. <clears throat> um, first of all, um, by far the most important vector-borne disease worldwide is this one, is malaria. It, malaria still kills millions of people a year, especially infants, and um, it is transmitted by one genus of mosquito, uh, which is Anopheles. And Anopheles is distinguished by the fact that it can, it actually picks up the malaria virus and a major part of the malaria parasite life cycle takes place inside the mosquito. The organism that causes malaria is plasmodium. There are several species of plasmodium and the disease, that, it's always malaria that they cause, but it differs in its details. It differs in some of its symptoms and manifestations depending on which one you, you're talking about. So that's malaria, top of the list for all sorts of reasons. It, it's a very, it's still a very, very important disease worldwide. This disease here, African trypanosomiasis, is also known as sleeping sickness. And um, sleeping sickness actually is a disease which is transmitted by this insect. It's a fly called Glossina, the tsetse fly. But here, this 
disease has a reservoir as well. And the reservoir is in, usually inside ca in cattle or in other, um, in antelopes, uh, things like that. And um, so the, there's a reservoir of the disease and the glossina, the tsetse fly, moves the parasite between that reservoir and the human hosts. Also a very important disease and um, a widespread in, in Africa, especially in tropical Africa. Um, this disease here, Chagas disease, is also trypanosoma, but which is a, a blood parasite, uh, but it's a different species and it occurs primarily in South America. And uh, in, surprisingly enough, Chagas disease is transmitted not by a mosquito, or, uh, I mean a tsetse fly, but by a bed bug called triatoma. So, um, there are various, uh, let me just take uh, this as an example. This uh, dengue fever is one of the viral diseases which is transmitted by mosquitoes. There are several genera of mosquito which will transmit viral diseases. Dengue is one of them. This is an, is an encephalitis, a brain inflammation. And then you will also have heard of Zika, which is also transmitted by a various gen genera of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are one of the most important arthropod vectors in the world. They transmit several different diseases, which are all really, really important. Um, here, I will just uh, t take this one here for the moment because um, this is one which is of interest here in the United States. And uh, this is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. There are actually a number of these diseases which are caused by a really strange organism. Uh, we won't probably, we'll maybe mention it again, but um, it's called a rickettsia. And uh, rickettsia is a very, very much reduced bacterial cell. Um, and they are responsible for, there are various rickettsias that produce uh, these kinds of fevers, fevers these hemorrhagic fevers. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is one. And many of them, many of the rickettsias are transmitted by ticks. Ticks are arachnids. They are related to the spiders and things like that. And they, they frequently transmit these uh, rickettsias. Ticks also transmit another disease, which is a bacterial disease called Lyme disease. And that is, a they, this is um, primarily in the Northeast of the United States, is caused by a bacterium called Borrelia. Borrelia burgdorferi, and uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is actually a spirochete, and um, it's transmitted by the tick. The tick is its major host are deer, but they will bite humans if you wander into their territory. They will feed on any warm-blooded organism, and in doing so, they can transmit Lyme disease. Lyme disease, we will mention it again later on. Lyme disease um, varies a tremendous amount. Most people, they just have an acute episode and then they recover. And there's no, no more problems. But in some people, it sets up a chronic disease process. And often that disease process involves neurological symptoms as well as arthritic symptoms, joint symptoms, and things like that. Transmitted again by a tick. So there's a variety for you of the different kinds of vectors and their diseases. Okay, so now as you, most of you are, are interested in, in the health sciences, here's a very important area of epidemiology that you need to know about. And these are infections which are associated with healthcare facilities. It's often said that the most dangerous place for a sick person to go is a hospital. And it's 
not that it is not simply ironic or sarcastic. In fact, it is in some ways it is true. And we'll think a little bit more about it in a minute. These healthcare associated infections are also known, you will often see them referred to as nosocomial or nosocomial infections. And they are infections which are strictly limited to those which are acquired because somebody attended a healthcare facility. They are in amazingly common. Um, they affect about one in 25 hospital patients in the United States. And uh, United States, we like to think that our healthcare facilities uh, are modern and hygienic and up to date and, and everything else. Nonetheless, nosocomial infections are surprisingly common. And in the United States alone, there are about 70,000 deaths per year due to hospital um, healthcare associated infections acquired in the hospital. About 30% of these are easily preventable. Um, studies have shown, for example, that many healthcare facilities, many healthcare workers actually observe very poor uh, hygiene regimens. Um, that, that many, many, many of these in 2 million cases a year could be prevented with very simple common sense hygiene methods. Scrubbing the hands, for example, or disinfecting hands with, as we are getting so used to doing now, disinfecting hands with a, a, a sterilizing solution of alcohol or whatever. Um, uh, being careful um, to change clothes, uh, change a coat for a white coat for or a protective coat or whatever, if you've dealt with somebody known to have an infection. All of these sort of things, they are very, they sound very simple, they sound common sense. But what you need to remember is that in many hospitals, the ratio of patients to healthcare worker is very high. And people are often uh, extremely pressed. They are working under pressure the whole time to afford care to as many patients as they can. So they, it, under those circumstances, it is very, very easy to begin to forget to sterilize your hands when you leave a patient and you go to the next patient, for example. Um, in addition, there's something else that needs to be mentioned, and that is the healthcare workers often feel pressured to work when they themselves are ill. And they may actually act as a vector of disease. They may acquire disease in the hospital setting and then transmit it to a patient. That is still that is still a nosocomial infection. And m much of this, um, much of the responsibility for this rests not on the healthcare worker, but on administration to make it easy for healthcare workers to observe these procedures. Um, often, you, you, the blame for widespread nosocomial epidemic or whatever can, when you examine it, you find that it can be laid at the door of administration who are pressuring staff either because they don't hire enough staff or because they set standards which are too high for turnover and everything else. So <clears throat> why do we say that a hospital is a bad place for a sick person to go? Well, first of all, um, people in, who go into a hospital very often are uh, already in a debilitated state. Many of the patients are, are actually ill already. Um, and they um, are susceptible to infections, especially to secondary infections that they encounter. The next thing is that microorganisms in a hospital setting are incredibly common. You've got pe many people in the hospital who are suffering from infectious disease. And 
so that in, the infectious agents are common in the hospital setting already. The next one is a little, maybe a little bit difficult to accept, but I'm going to mention later on a specific disease associated with this, and that is overuse of antibiotics. In a hospital setting, it is very easy and very tempting to resort to a quick method of dealing with um, an illness and to blast a patient, for example, with antibiotics. Um, even when, the, if it was carefully thought about, it be realized that the antibiotics are not necessarily needed. This does two things. The first thing is it depletes a patient's microbiota drastically. So, for example, you deplete the mic gut microflora with antibiotics when you take antibiotics to try and kill a pathogen. That leaves the gut vulnerable secondary inf infections by pathogenic bacteria, but it also weakens the patient even further and makes them, more, ma makes them more susceptible to other infections. The next thing is I've already, I have already mentioned that healthcare workers themselves act as vectors. They actually act as mechanical vectors. They can physically transport uh, pathogens from one patient to another, or from a fomite, like a table or whatever, or a bedpan or something like that, they can transmit to another patient. Um, and there, the, the healthcare worker is actually the vector. Quite apart from the fact, as I've mentioned, hospital workers also get sick. They pick up an illness from a patient, carry on working, and transmitted to another patient. The next thing is that many uh, hospitals will have a population of patients who are actually compromised. Uh, and that, that is their immune system, for example, is severely impaired. That can be because of lengthy debilitating illness. It could be because the hospital cases for some like burn patients, perhaps or the hospital caters for people with immunodeficiency diseases, like, like HIV or other immunodeficiencies. In addition, um, patients who are undergoing chemotherapy or who, are being, who have had transplants, anything like that, they have severe, may have severely impaired immune systems. Now that means that they are not only themselves susceptible to disease, but they are also likely, they can act as a reservoir of disease in the hospital. And it can be extremely difficult to, to treat people who are immune compromised, for example, um, for any of those reasons. Okay, so <clears throat> let's have a look and see uh, what are the, where, what kind of, of infections are we talking about. One of the most important are urinary tract infections. There can be various reasons for this. Prolonged bed rest will predispose people to urinary tract infections. That, that is one thing. The second thing is very often, um, Patients in hospital may have indwelling catheters or have been catheterized for one reason or another. And that if that is uh, one way in which these urinary tract infections can, can be promulgated. Um, the next thing is that these urinary tract infections, much more common in women than in men. Um, that is largely due to the fact that the urethra is much shorter and the, the meatus, the opening of the urethra, lies much closer to the bladder and it was also the, and is also enclosed in the genitalia, if you want to think of it like that, where in male the, the urethra is longer and is essentially more external. The meatus is in a way more external. Um, urinary tract infections are extremely serious. Um, 
of course, urinary tract infections can occur in people outside the hospital setting. Um, and that, that we know, but very often urinary tract infections in somebody who is otherwise healthy are a nuisance. Are they, you know, and they pain, they may be painful and everything else, but they are not dangerous. They're not necessarily dangerous, but in a hospital setting, they can be dangerous because that what starts as something like a urethritis, an infection of the urethra, moves to a bladder infection, can then end up being a full-blown kidney infection or even a systemic infection. And um, there are many very serious outcomes to uh, possible outcomes to a urinary tract infection. The commonest um, agents of these urinary tract infections are things which are associated with the gut. E. coli is, is one of them. Um, there, and there are various other proteas, uh, various other bacteria especially. And uh, this points often to poor hygiene, to poor wiping, for example, um, of the anus and the genital area, poor cleaning um, of the genital area, especially in women. So that's urinary tract infections. The next major block of nosocomial infections, unsurprisingly, are those associated with surgery. Now, when um, we are so used to the idea that surgery is a lifesaver and everything else, it's very easy for us to forget that when we undergo surgery, we are breaching the major barrier between areas of high bacterial count, the skin, the gut, the gut cavity rather, etc. And what is actually sacred ground, which is the interior of our body where the organs are, which is largely pathogen free, bacteria free, it's largely sterile. When you undergo surgery, you breach that boundary. And it is almost inevitable during surgery, some bacteria are going, to, are going to make their way into the area, the surgical area. The, the attempt by the surgical staff and everybody else is to limit that as much as possible and to limit the amount of bacteria, for example, to a level where the patient's own immune system will easily be able to deal with any few bacteria that enter a wound. But it is very common for surgical wounds to become infected. And they can, they can be extremely difficult to deal with. One of the reasons being that so many bacteria now in a hospital setting are resistant to antibiotics. Many, many of the bacteria that we commonly encounter in a hospital setting will actually be resistant to most of the common antibiotics. The next block, <coughs> excuse me, the next block are extremely important, especially in the elderly. And these are lower respiratory tract infections. And these carry a very, very high mortality rate, 13 to 55%. Now, under normal circumstances, in a healthy person's respiratory tract, bacteria are trapped in the upper and the middle part of the respiratory tract. They are trapped by the mucus sheets that line all of the, the respiratory surfaces. Those respiratory surfaces have cilia, which conduct that mucus upwards in the, lo in the res lo lower respiratory tract, they conduct it upwards towards the back of your throat where it is swallowed. In your nose, it, they tend to move it towards your nose where you, you blow it out. So this is an incredibly powerful protective mechanism because mucus also contains um, disinfectant agents as well. All of this is to keep the lower respiratory tract completely free 
the alveoli, all of the, those the fine parts of the lungs, the small sacs where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged between the blood and, and, the, and the, the air in the lung, all of these areas are effectively sterile under normal circumstances. Any entrance of bacteria into those areas tends to set up an inflammatory condition. The tissues of the lung begin to react strongly to the presence of bacteria because they very seldom see them. So there's a strong immune response, and this tends to produce fluids which begin to fill the alveoli. And often that actually encourages bacterial development. Once that uh, begins, once the alveoli begin filling with, with fluid and with bacteria, that is what we refer to as a pneumonia. There are certain bacteria, like Streptococcus pneumoniae, which are specifically um, associated with pneumonias. Um, hence the name, Streptococcus pneumoniae. But uh, there are many bacteria which, if they end up in the lungs, can actually provoke a, a pneumonia situation. This is, becomes extremely dangerous in people who are on prolonged bed rest. And it's one of the reasons why patients are frequently made to sit up um, and even have their their backs patted, et cetera, et cetera, in an attempt to get them to continue to clear the lungs, to continue to move things up to that mucus escalator and get, the, get them clear, get the alveoli cleared as much as possible before bacteria arrive and set up the pneumonia. But this can be very, very difficult um, in weak, in debilitated patients. And especially in the elderly, these pneumonias can develop extremely quickly and become fatal very quickly. In the old days, they used to call this pneumonia from Streptococcus pneumonia, they used to call it the old person's friend because very frequently, this is the terminal illness. The person has, is very, very old, bedridden, They've maybe had a stroke, and they've been lying there for ages and ages and ages, months. And then all of a sudden they develop this pneumonia and it is rampant within a day, within, a day, within two days, they, they die. Um, these pneumonias are extremely serious. So this one here, this is um, increasingly common, unfortunately, an increasingly common set of diseases. These are gastrointestinal infections, um, which largely result from overuse of antibiotics. There is one in particular, which is of huge importance. And um, this is an, this organism called Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is an obligate anaerobe, uh, but it's, it, it occurs commonly um, just as one or two cells, as spores actually, we, we inhale it, we, sorry, we swallow it as spores, but it usually causes absolutely no problem. It can't get a hold at all in the gut because of the rich gut microflora. So we never, it never causes disease in a healthy gut. But in a gut which has been cleared of, of its microflora by antibiotic use, the Clostridium spores can actually fix, sit and germinate on the gut wall. And when they do, there is a peculiar disease process. They cause a thick coating to develop. It's a thick coating of mucus and of dead gut cells and things, and it actually allows the underneath to become anaerobic. And the clostridium now can begin, the population can begin to increase because it's got a, a, a rich, warm, anaerobic environment. And under those circumstances, clostridium difficile can begin to colonize the entire gut. This 
covering is called a pseudo membrane. And very characteristically, if, if the person has a gastroendoscopy, if the gut is examined with a camera, you will see these huge patches of white um, pseudo membrane plastered up against the gut wall. Um, it causes an intense inflammatory reaction and uh, it's extremely debilitating and um, extremely difficult to treat. They do not respond well to antibiotics themselves. They are largely hidden away from antibiotic and from the immune system under the pseudo membrane. And Clostridium difficile, that, that name there, difficile, difficulty, it is indeed a very, very difficult thing to deal with. But there's a simple solution. And you, you, this is that you can take feces from a healthy person and transplant them into the gut. And if you do that, as long as you're not giving other antibiotics at the same time, if you do that very quickly, very, very quickly, within, within hours, Bacteria from that healthy feces sample will begin to colonize the gut again. And the, the Clostridium difficile have no competitive ability at all. As soon as that happens, they begin to be eliminated. So this is now, this is now a, a solution that is resorted to in many, many cases. Clostridium difficile is particularly important in the elderly. Um, and the immune compromised who have been vigorously treated with, with antibiotics and have lost their gut microflora. Um, other ones, um, there are several um, infections of the bloodstream, either bacteremias, septicemias, or even sepsis. Now go back and have a look at the difference between those. It depends largely on what bacterium we're talking about that is present in the, the in the circulatory system and how it has arrived there um, as to the severity as they're all severe um, but the course of illness depends much on the type of bacteria that have entered the bloodstream other all sorts of things just all sorts of things can be transmitted during uh, a hospital visit. And even a brief hospital visit, a uh, visit to an emergency room or a lengthy hospital stay, anything which arises uh, as a result of that, we would regard as a healthcare associated infection. Okay, so if you look at your slide set, you'll see um, that there are four slides and there's a little animation. And um, if this is extra credit opportunity for you. Uh, just review those slides, please, and prepare a two-page explanation of what, as a health healthcare worker, what would be what are effective methods that you could adopt as a healthcare worker, which would prevent nosocomial infections. Okay. And that you can send it to me any time in the week after Thanksgiving. That's fine. Okay, and so just give me one minute, please. Uh, I lose me. Right. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about actual pathogenic agents and about how they cause disease. We'll discuss viruses first. And then when once we've, we can only do this briefly, you will realize I could teach a course on virology for a whole year and still not tell you everything there was to know. So it's a very brief introduction, just give you the idea about how these, how viruses, what viruses are, what they, how they operate, and then some of the diseases that we commonly deal with. Um, and naturally, we will talk a little bit about COVID because that's so much on our minds at the moment. 
okay, so first of all, what what is a virus? Well, the most amazing thing about viruses is that they are not living things. There is nothing about them which enables us to classify them as an organism. Why? Well, first of all, we need to remember how we defined a living organism. We did it right at the beginning of this class. And we said, a living organism, first of all, it is defined by the fact that all life is cellular. And the cell is defined by the cell membrane around it. Well, many viruses, some viruses do have a membrane around them. It's not a cell membrane. But many viruses have no cell membrane around them at all. Second of all, all living things, all that they have a metabolism, and their met the metabolism is governed by enzymes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of which are coded for by DNA. All living things that we know of have DNA as the hereditary material. Many viruses do not. You're going to hear they have bizarre hereditary material. Some have DNA, but others have RNA. Some of them have double-stranded RNA. Some of them have single-stranded DNA. It's absolutely, uh, they are extraordinary in their diversity, but they are not alive. They have no metabolism. And they are absolutely dependent on a host to be able to reproduce. They have to commandeer all of the cell machinery of a host and turn the host effectively into a viral factory. They take cells, they, in, they infect, and they get that cell to produce more virus, not to do its normal business, but to devote itself to producing virus. And in the course of doing that, they irreparably damage the cell and its functioning. That's why we get sick. So um, here is a typical virus. Very, very, very small. Viruses are extremely small. They lie most way below our ability to see them with the light microscope. Um, and uh, they, um, they're obligatory intracellular parasites. They have no functioning outside of a cell. Anything that, anything that they do they, happens inside a cell, and that's why they require a living host cell to multiply. As I told you, they can contain DNA or RNA. At the very minimum, a virus will have a strand of nucleic acid of some sort, either DNA or RNA, which is, it contains its genetic information. And that strand is surrounded by a protein coat, which is protective. That's the very minimum. And some viruses, that's all that they consist of, a protein coat and inside a strand of, of um, nucleic acid of some sort. They have no ribosomes. They have no cellular machinery. Sometimes they do have some, some accessory enzymes, proteins and enzymes um, inside that protein coat included in them. But there is no metabolism. There's no, func there's no functioning of this unit that makes up the virus. So there's no energetics. There's no way for it to generate ATP and use ATP. Instead, it w the, most of the processes of the, the virus are entirely passive until it enters the, a cell, and then it takes over the, the genetic machinery of the cell, and it changes all the genetic instructions of the cell. So the cell stops doing its normal business and devotes itself to producing a virus. So viruses can infect any living thing. Absolutely every living thing has its own viruses. And um, that, that means, for example, bacteria, there are many, many, many viruses that infect bacteria. Viruses tend, though, to be extremely specific they tend to have a very limited host range. So they only infect a particular group of living 
things, living organisms, and very often they only infect particular cells in that particular host. But beyond that, every living thing has its viruses. Bacteria have their viruses, fungi have their viruses. Um, of course, all the animals, many plants, there are thousands upon thousands of plant viruses. And in fact, although I won't go into any detail, but they've actually discovered that there are viruses which infect viruses. There are viruses which have to commandeer another virus before they can then infect a host. So they are very, very, very diverse. We have very little idea about where viruses came from. The prevailing idea is that they are kind of wandering genes that kind of develop the ability to propagate themselves. So um, this is it for some examples about their specificity. Let's have a look at some of the viruses here. Rabies virus, which um, we, uh, we will hear more about later on. Rabies virus is a very, very uh, terrible virus. Um, and, uh, but rabies only infect mammals, but it can affect virtually any, any mammal. There are one or two mammals which are resistant to it, um, but uh, by and large, it can infect most mammals, can be infected with the rabies virus. Um, the measles virus uh, can infect any ape. So um, it affects humans very badly. It can be extremely dangerous, um, but it's even, more, um, it's even more dangerous in other apes like the chimpanzees. And it has been observed to be epidemic in some populations of, of chimpanzees, for example. Gorillas as well also suffer from, from measles. A disease like HIV is very interesting because HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is strictly a human virus. It, we don't, this is one of the difficulties of working with HIV scientifically is we do not have an animal model. We don't have anything where the virus, where we can infect um, something with the virus and have it reproduce the effects that we observe in humans. You can use, you can infect some uh, apes with HIV, but it produces an entirely different and mi much milder illness. It doesn't reproduce the, the the disease that we see in humans. But HIV actually originated in apes, in other apes other than us. It entered the human populations quite long ago and became entirely adapted to humans. So it can't now easily be transmitted back to another ape. Um, but it def very definitely originated in, in the apes. But the apes are not reservoirs of HIV because they don't actually suffer from, from the disease. Okay, so the question then we, we can start to ask of next, by the way, one term that you must get used to, a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So a, bac a, a bacteriophage or a phage is a virus that specifically infects bacteria. It doesn't infect anything else. So we have to ask the question now, how does, what is it that determines that? What is it that determines a virus infects only a human, for example, and only infects maybe its lung tissue, whatever? The answer is that on the outside of the virus, there are often proteins which are able to bind to specific proteins on a specific cell. And they will only bind if that protein is present. And our cells are very clearly labeled with proteins that the virus can recognize and bind to. So that, that is the way that it is done. We'll see it in more detail in a minute. So just to give you some idea of the size of different viruses, the largest viruses actually um, are things like um, the, these uh, um, 
This is a bacteriophage. This is Ebola virus, which is one of the biggest viruses. And um, they are uh, heli called helical viruses. It's like a fiber more than anything else. And um, these are, the, are amongst the, the largest of the viruses. This here, just to, for comparison, this here is a chlamydia. Chlamydia is one of the smallest of all of the bacteria. And it's 300 nanometers wide. E. coli, the cell, is about 3,000 nanometers long. So this is one tenth of an E. coli cell. Here's a red blood corpuscle for comparison. So these are by far the largest there. Um, most of the other viruses are much, much smaller. So for example, here's bacteriophage, which is only 24 nanometers. Polio virus, a very fierce virus indeed, is only 30 nanometers. So that, that polio virus there is one tenth the size of chlamydia, which itself is one tenth the size of E. coli. Uh, these here, rhinovirus and adenoviruses, these are uh, cold viruses. Again, very small, 30. This one's larger than that, it's 90 nanometers. These are, these are vanishingly small objects. And you'll realize that, for example, when we talk about respiratory droplets, a respiratory droplet is much larger, even the smallest ones are much larger than a red blood cell. So you can imagine how many of these virus particles could be contained in a droplet like that and be transmitted to, to another host. One of the very largest, um, by the way, of the viruses is this one here, um, which is vaccinia virus. And vaccinia virus is actually um, almost an artificial virus. It's a virus which has been developed from smallpox, from pox viruses and actually is used to be used to vaccinate and it was one of the largest viruses nonetheless all of them way way smaller than we can see with uh, with the light microscope they have to be visualized with an electron microscope it's the only way to to see them viruses were actually discovered by quite early on in the, in the 19th century and they were discovered because micro, early microbiologists, when they prepared uh, very delicate media, they used to sterilize their media. Instead of that, of autoclaving them, they would pass them through a filter, a bacterial filter. The filter was small enough to stop all bacteria. So it, very often the filter, in, in fact, would, would the holes in the, in the filter would, would be some, a couple of nanometers across. That, that be all. So that usually when you passed your media through the, the filter, trapped all the bacteria and what emerged from the filter was sterile. The only thing was they discovered that in fact there were things in that filtrate which could cause infection. Not in animals initially. They discovered that the filtrate could cause infection in plants. And that was one of the very first of the viruses to be cultured, if you like, and described was a plant virus. And that was this one here, tobacco mosaic virus. Tobacco mosaic virus was also the very first one to be visualized by an electron microscope. And that was in the 1940s um, or early 50s, I can't remember exactly. So it was actually very late before we were actually able to start to see viral particles. They are just so small, so far below the ability of the light microscope to visualize them. Nonetheless, these minute things contain all of the information they need to force a host to produce them. And so that's we need to start thinking about. Okay, let's have a look at some of the structures. Uh, of viral particles. I told you there is always 
um, some sort of hereditary material, some nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. And the DNA or RNA, we'll find out, can be in various forms. But around that, there is always some sort of protein coat. Now, this here is, is a, called a polyhedral virus. You can see it just has this geometric shape to it. But these proteins on the outside here are actually functional. They don't only protect what's inside here, shelter it. They also govern what cells this viral particle can stick to, which cell, therefore, which cells this virus can infect. So this is a polyhedral virus. It's also a non-enveloped virus, and you'll see the, the relevance of that in a minute. It's just got the protein coat, that's all. This coat here, the protein coat around the nucleic acid is called the capsid. There is usually only one protein coat. Some viruses do in fact have two, but the one that shelters, protects the, the, the nucleic acid is called the capsid. And um, the uh, the, Viral particle itself, the functional viral particle, whatever it consists of, this is called a virion, V-I-R-I-O-N, the virion. And the virion is the equivalent of a cell. It's the viral equivalent of a cell, excepting, of course, don't forget, it has none of the characteristics of a cell. It's not, it's not a functional met metabolizing organism but we refer to the entire unit as being the virion, consisting of the capsid, in this case, this nucleic acid inside. The capsid is usually made up of individual units, repeating units, which are called the capsomeres there. And remember, capsomeres can have very important functions in determining what this virus adheres to and what it enters. So here's um, a typical enveloped virus. Many, many, many of the animal viruses that we will talk about are enveloped viruses. So have a look first, and you'll see that on the inside here, there is the nucleic acid there, this, whatever it is. It could be DNA, it could be RNA, depending on the species of virus. Surrounding it here, is the capsid, but in this case, the capsid is this long tube-like structure. It doesn't necessarily have to have that shape. It could also have a polyhedral shape like this. It just depends on, on the type of virus that you're looking at. This one, in fact, looks very, very much like a coronavirus. And I, I think it probably is a coronavirus shown here. When you visualize it under the electron microscope. This is the sort of thing you see. They called it a coronavirus because it looked like a crown there. And this is this membrane around the outside called the envelope. The basis of the envelope is derived from the host. It can be derived from virtually any membrane inside the host. If this is a eukaryote cell, therefore, it could be derived from the endoplasmic reticulum, sometimes derived from the nuclear membrane, and quite often it's derived from the cell membrane. And we'll see the way in which these things happen. And the usual process is that this capsid with the nucleic acid is packaged first, made first, and then it buds out. If it's comes from the endoplasmic reticulum, it buds out endoplasmic reticulum membrane. But in there, before that happens, the, these proteins are embedded in that patch of membrane that is going to form the envelope. These are viral proteins here, embedded in the membrane. And they perform exactly the same function as we heard about before. It is these proteins which determine which cell this virus can adhere to and which virus it 
it can enter and the mechanism by which it will get into the cell. We'll see that there are different ways to get in. This uh, is a look which we would have for many different animal viruses, by the way. But I, this, I believe, is a coronavirus. And the coronavirus was specifically named, as I've told you, because this looks like a crown. You can see all the proteins. These bars here in the membrane are the viral proteins. Here on the inside is a rather confused look at the capsid. So there are also other viruses. I showed you some of those very large viruses. They are helical viruses. And uh, they are made up a little bit dif differently. They still have a capsid and uh, made up of the capsomeres. But very often, the uh, nucleic acid is associated very closely with these, with these capsomeres. And the capsomeres are laid down in a spiral fashion. So the, the, the nucleic acid is also in a spiral and attached to the capsomeres, and they can form very long filaments. This is one particular interest to us. This is the Ebola virus. And Ebola virus, very, very easy to recognize. It's a very long virus. And at the end, it has this peculiar looped structure. And um, I don't know if you even know what I'm talking about. If I tell you, it looks like a carpet beater. An old, in the old days, they used to hang their carpets up and they used to beat them with a thing made of, of um, uh, a wire or whatever. And it was in this shape, a uh, carpet beater shape. And uh, this is very typical for the Ebola virus, which we will have a word about later on. So this is a helical virus. There are many, many helical viruses. Um, some of them actually are quite small. And the tobacco mosaic virus, one of the very first viruses to be described, and then the very first virus to be visualized, was, is also a helical virus like this. So uh, this um, here, just to remind, this is an icosahedral virus, just another of these geometric viruses. But this is just serves as an introduction um, to um, the particular shape of some of the viruses that we will encounter. This here is very typical. This is a, uh, an enveloped virus. Here's the membrane around the outside. Here are the viral proteins here embedded in it. But look in here, and you'll see it's got a polyhedral capsule there with its with the, the uh, nucleic acid in the inside. This, by the way, would be very typical of a herpes virus. This looks very much like a herpes virus. So again, here are the proteins on the outside. There may be many different kinds of protein, but these are viral proteins. These are not host proteins, although the host had to make them. It did so under instruction from the virus. But these are viral proteins which determine its infectivity. And also, by the way, determine the process whereby it infects. It's going to infect its host. So here's my favorite. And um, this, in fact, is a bacteriophage, a bacterial virus. And this we refer to as a complex virus. And it's complex because, look, it's got an icosahedral head here. That's the capsid made of protein. Here on the inside is the, the nucleic acid. In this case, uh, this one is called a T even phage. That's just its name. It's called T even. And it has DNA as its nucleic material. And all of the DNA is packaged here in this head here. It's the most cunning thing you, you, you ever hear about. Below here, there is a long tube. And that tube, the hollow of the tube, communicates with the hollow inside the head. This here is a helical part. It's a sheath. And it's a, hel it's a helical part made of protein. And it is like a spring. And the spring is cocked. 
So the spring is pulled open like that under normal circumstances. At the bottom here, there is a plate. There's a base plate. You can see it's got some little spikes in it. Here's a base plate, and then it has these legs called the tail fibers. Those tail fibers, normally they are extended. When the virus is free, floating around, those tail fibers are extended. In this case, it's the tail fibers which determine where, it's, where it can settle, where it can fix. In this case, it fixes to bacteria and will fix to the, back, to the bacterial cell wall. Now that cell wall, you'll remember in bacteria, the cell wall is thick and it is quite protective of the, the interior of the cell on the inside. The virus has to get through that, through that somehow. So what it does is the legs are extended it lands on the bacterium and the legs kind of collapse and they push this base plate up against the cell wall and at the same time this spring snaps closed and it pushes this tube into the bacterium just like an injection syringe so it actually sticks this tube here into the the cell into the bacterial cell and when that happens all of the dna is spat through that tube into the cytoplasm of the cell all of this elaborate mechanism is on the outside stays on the outside and it's purely there to make sure that this virus this bacteriophage finds a suitable host and successfully injects its dna into the host once the DNA arrives in the bacterium, it actually chops up the DNA and um, it stops the normal function of, of the bacterium. And instead, it turns the bacterium into a, a viral factory. The bacterium will start producing all of these proteins that are needed to make all of these different parts. It will assemble all of those proteins in correctly and it will then reproduce the DNA and will package the DNA into the head. Very, very cunning and very, very efficient system. So um, when we grow a bacteria, a lot of work on viruses has been done on bacteriophages. Bacteriophages, most of them are quite easy to grow. Um, because we can grow bacteria so easily on solid media. So if what we usually do, if we're growing bacteriophage, for example, we'll grow a lawn of the, of the host bacterium on agar, so it forms a thick congruent growth, and we can then inoculate that with a very, very, very dilute solution of viral particles and, we're, and hope that we separated viral particle from viral particle, that we've done enough dilution that we will have separated the viral particles from one another so that each of them initially will infect one bacterium. Then that bacterium releases viral particles in its immediate environment and they infect the bacteria immediately around the original host. And what we end up with, we end up with clear areas called plaques plaques, I suppose you should say, in America. And um, they are clearings in that lawn of bacteria. And we express, we can then work out a number. We can work out a number of viruses in our original population. That should sound familiar to you because it's the same method that we use basically for determining bacterial number by spread plating, right? We did a dilution, then we did a spread plate, and we counted how many colonies, and we assumed that every colony arose from one bacteria. Here, we're doing a similar process. We're doing a very high dilution of viral particles. We're spreading it onto a lawn of the hosts, and assuming that each little clearing here arose from one viral particle. So that is a plaque there there each of these are plaques each one representing one viral particle but we usually to be safe we say one 
plaque forming unit. Just as with bacteria, we said one colony forming unit. Here we say one plaque forming unit, but in our minds, most of them we assume are produced by one virus. It's a very good way of counting how many viral particles you have, but also a very good way of culturing virus. And here is the major difficulty of working with viruses in scientifically. You always have to grow them in a living host. And that is not, not always that easy to do. Here in bacteriophage, it is usually very easy to do. When we start talking about animal viruses, it may not be that easy. So uh, in the laboratory, um, we have a limited number of choices. We can grow virus, um, a, a disease causing virus, for example, can be grown in an animal model. We can try growing it in white rats or in laboratory rats or laboratory mice or, or whatever. Um, that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, viruses can also be, be uh, grown in cell culture. So we can actually, if we know more or less what the cells are that that virus infects, we can set up cell cultures of that kind of cell and then infect it with the virus. This is a useful way of doing it because in cell culture, we can observe the same kinds of effects that we saw on that lawn of bacteria. And we can actually count bacteria, the viruses, and we can do various things with them. One of the most useful ways of cultivating a virus, which actually can be used for many different viruses, is to grow them in embryonated eggs, in fertilized eggs, where the, the, the hen's egg, or sometimes they use duck's eggs, but it's usually a hen's egg, um, is actually, the, the embryo is actually developing. And uh, for some reason, uh, egg is very, very tolerant of the vir of different viruses. So uh, many different virus kinds can be grown at least for a certain length of time inside, inside eggs. And you can track the, the course of the development of the virus by seeing different effects on the embryo and on the cells of the egg itself. All right, so um, let's leave it there for today. And uh, we'll, continue, we'll finish this at our next class. Don't forget, please, your, uh, that you have tests on Monday. And um, in addition, tomorrow, if uh, you want to contact me to um, ask questions, uh, one o'clock tomorrow, I am available. And I'll send out the, the Zoom meeting number uh, for you to contact me. Are there any questions from any of you? Yeah, I just have one. Oh, sorry. Uh, beg your pardon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, what chapter the exam gonna be? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What is what? The chapter for the exam. I, I absolutely can't hear you. I can't. Uh, hear she just wants to know what chapters are gonna be on the exam. Um, I also had the same question. I want to know if the viruses will be on the exam that's on Monday. Yes, vi the, what we've done today will be. Um, so um, let me just uh, let me just think. Um, I think it was um, a photosynthesis. Let me check. Let me check and send you an email. I, right. I don't want to mislead you. I, I'll check now and I'll send send you an email immediately uh, with the, the chapter numbers. I think there is an email already, but that's fine. I'll send another. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Nice to see you. I hope you're all well. I hope your families are all well as well. So hunker down, I'm afraid. Hunker down. Thank you, you too, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank Take care. Yep, thanks.